welcome everyone here to this online digital panel discussing what pleasure activism means. So you've obviously come here out of some type of, of curiosity. So I hope during this next hour or so together, um, we'll all become a little clearer around pleasure activism and, and what it means for us and what it potentially also could mean for us as a tool to help us um, move forward into the future. And I just want to kind of acknowledge the fact that at the moment, talking and thinking or planning for the future is increasingly challenging uh, given our current situation. Um, but we really hope that this hour together um, is a sort of container or a portal for us to have a bit of hope at, at what might come. Uh, just a bit of digital housekeeping uh, for the next hour. Um, we will have a, a opportunity at the end for questions. So please do put it into the Q&A tab um, as it happens and we'll hopefully be able to answer any questions or comments or reflections uh, that you might have about pleasure activism or for any one of our panelists. Um, and to give you a bit of context, so um, I'm the Knowledge Exchange Lead for the School of Media and Communication. And within the School of, of Media and Communication here at the London College of Fashion, we identify and respond to critical issues of our times. And one of the ways that we do that is an exchange event that we host yearly uh, between academics, students, alumni, and industry um, in a discussion to tease out the philosophical and political, cultural and aesthetic threads of the zeitgeist. So we held this for the first time uh, last year. And from that session together, we identified the philosophy of anti-fragility. And anti-fragility is a philosophy that uses chaos and the unknown as a catalyst for growth and transformation. And we last year, last academic year, integrated that into a range of activations, activities, and units within the school and externally. Um, and this was all planned pre-pandemic. So it really became an important tool for us to navigate um, the, the challenging times that were to come. So this year, we, through a similar type of event that happened online in July, we identified and, and found this philosophy, um, pleasure activism. So what does pleasure activism mean? At this time, we acknowledge from working with our students, staff, and alongside our industries that there is a collective sense of fear and frustration in the context of all that is impacting us globally. Frustration against the systems that no longer serve us and the opportunities that have been taken away from us and fearful of the unknown and insecure future ahead of us. This fear and frustration building up over time, day after day, contained within our bodies, the pressure augmenting, needing a release valve. Here at the School of Media and Communication, we approach our disciplines with a shared understanding of the body as a creative site and the capacity of our bodies as a creative site. As the philosopher Spinoza suggests, a joyful affect is understood to be an enhancement of our capacity to be in the world and connect with others. When our capacity for joy and pleasure is under threat, how does that impact the body as a creative site? Ultimately, what can a body do? This dialogue around pleasure activism is our attempt at providing a container for better understanding and engaging our collective agency and our collective privilege. But for a reset, the previous hierarchies and borders that separated us between me versus you and us versus them must transition towards a collective we. We must see ourselves as an interconnected living ecology, a collection of agents becoming stronger reinforced through cooperation. And this reset takes courage, an anti-fragile mentality and collective power to build something new transformative habits and a reassessment of what we really need to build the foundation for a better tomorrow. But what do we really need? This question foregrounds our collective investigation into pleasure activism. What are my individual and our collective needs? As Adrienne Marie Brown states in her book, Pleasure Activism, The Politics of Feeling Good, 
Pleasure activism is the work we do to reclaim our whole happy and satisfiable selves from the impacts, delusions and limitations of oppression and or supremacy. Pleasure activists believe that by tapping into the potential goodness in each of us, we can generate justice and liberation, growing a healing abundance where we have been socialized to believe only scarcity exists. Here, we are not trying to distract ourselves with hedonistic ideas of pleasure and joy. We are collectively investigating the potential and power of pleasure as a human right and for embodied actionable change. So again, we ask, what can a body do in an attempt to understand what a body can do? So we begin this discussion today with a dialogue with our external community in the form of this panel to better understand what pleasure activism means externally. And we'll be bringing this learning back into our curriculum and into our units as we understand internally and listen to our students as the next generation and as the next generation of potential pleasure activists. So without further ado, I'm going to leave you in the very safe hands of uh, Ms. Shan U Walpita, who is a lecturer here um, in, at LCF and a Strategic Foresights Director as well. Um, so um, enjoy the panel. Hello, hello, welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for tuning in this evening. I'm really honored to be here and to be joined by so many of you, more than I expected and also to be moderating this discussion with amazing panelists this evening. Before we get started, I'd love to just take a second to extend a huge heartfelt thank you to Daniel, who we just so eloquently heard from, as per usual. And um, he is the driving force behind this event this evening, and he's just been brilliant. And I just also want to extend that thank you to Charlotte Troy, and of course, the entire LCF team for um, allowing us to have this discussion tonight. As Daniel said, talking about, I guess, pleasure and joy feels somewhat polarizing and perhaps ironically a little bit, I don't know, uncomfortable, especially in light of all of the uncertainty and flux that we're all experiencing collectively. Joy and pleasure seem somewhat intangible or possibly a distant memory or something that we deem somewhat um, intangible or experiencing a deficit. So my attraction to guiding this, this conversation this evening is to hopefully remind us that pleasure is something that we can have and that we will have. Um, and it is by no way meant to kind of minimize the struggles or I don't know, erase some of the issues that we've all been experiencing. Hopefully it's here to spark a little bit of joy this evening. So without further ado, I would love to welcome my lovely panelists, Ronnie, Wilson, and Delali, thank you so much for joining me this evening. They've all introduced, um, well, they've all got a little intro they're gonna discuss with you so they can tell you who they are and what they do in more detail. So without further ado, I'll let them take it away. I think we're starting with Wilson. Uh, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so for those who don't know me, my name is Wilson Oriyama. Um, I operate in a few different spaces and do a few different things, but the underpinning theme or thought under, across my work is um, human consumption and its effects on human behavior and the environment. So and this is manifested in, in various things such as like documentary, short films, uh, maybe poetry, uh, I co-founded a social change initiative called Regenerative Futures. And then there's other things that may come up depending on relevancy of, uh, to this panel. Anyway, so before um, kind of uh, going in line with what's being mentioned, before even diving into my slides, I, I want to say that although, so um, this was a very new term to me in terms of pleasure activism, and I do align with it as, to an extent, but I can't say that it's a primary pursuit of my work or or it should be. I think pleasure is, is part of a spectrum of, of different emotions that we will be required to go through on a day-to-day -day basis as, as humans. And it's not to be pursued as an ideal, but to, I, I definitely do feel in some way that it should, it should have some, uh, consume a large chunk of what you do like you should 
try and pursue some type of enjoyment, but that's not to say it should be everything. Anyway, um, onto the first slide. I, I say that also because typically um, with work and pleasure, of work in this case, activism, you can derive, or work you can derive pleasure from is seen as almost an almost impossible endeavor for the average adult. And for centuries, we have been conditioned to believe that our joys can only be found on week, weekends and holidays. Um, I use the example of Excalibur, which is just a great example for how we've just been conditioned and pressured to, to not believe that at any point we should feel joy or happiness in our, in our work. And the only times that we are capable of doing so is usually when we might be doing something we could get in trouble for, uh, which, is, which is a ridiculous concept in this, in this day and age. Next slide, please. Um, and then, of course, uh, for, for many people who, well, I'll read through this first. Although suffering will naturally be a part of our, our lives to some extent, it is over glamorized to the point where many will unnecessarily endure difficulties just for the sake of being able to say or look like they are suffering. We see this in the starving artist example who are celebrated for their pains and humble be beginnings, but often their eventual happiness and success is an unsettling sight for many. So this kind of um, extends this uh, ongoing uh, removal of pleasure from uh, anything because it's almost like uh it's almost like porn to people with regards to, to to seeing people struggle or in pain and i i think it's uh what am i trying to say uh it's it's just uh, it's just an outdated thought and not something that we should um be be thinking about in that way next slide please uh of course uh, activism has followed a similar path where you are expected to sacrifice any joys you may have and succumb to a life of difficulty and disappointment for the sake of the struggle. When presented in, the, in media, this narrative often has the undertone that the activists will not succeed in their life and have to indef indefinitely wear a pained expression on their face and as some would dis distastefully put it, enjoy being poor. Uh, this is absolutely not how it has to be now more so than ever it is clear we are able to blend the two thus deriving pleasure from activism or work because often you'll see whether it's like um climate strikes or 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 trying to argue for some cause that you believe uh, it could be um it could be anything from say uh trans rights or or, or women's rights or, or or any disadvantaged group in society that you may feel that needs uh, to be treated fairly than much more fairly than they are right now is um, often when painted in the media is is put is positioned in a way where you're not you're almost not allowed to show any any sign of joy or or happiness and I think that's part of the uh, uh, the systematic approach to kind of keeping people uh, oppressed to an extent. So, so we're kind of forced to create this separation between joy and happiness. Next slide, please. Um, going to a definition of activism, we can say, so sorry, I, I didn't clarify as we're moving forward. I was just, this is just more so of a, where we've been in terms of uh, the separation between work and, and, or work in this case, activism and pleasure and, um, where we've been in the past and where we are now and how possible it, while it may not have been the easiest thing to do say even a few decades ago now we're in an age and time where you can absolutely derive pleasure and uh, benefit from the work you do so but anyway um to give a definition of activism we can say it's the use of direct and noticeable action to achieve a result usually a political or social one uh, next slide please and, and you may be thinking if it's, why is it different now than ever? And we can say, while the definition has uh, somewhat uh, remained the same, what is possible through activism has changed massively uh, because previously it was protests and self-destruction or self-immolation where people were, were was, was the only way that people could bring about a change or feel like they could bring about a change because pre-internet maybe their voices weren't be able weren't able to be heard or or maybe they didn't have any enough social socioeconomic backing to 
to support any of their ideas or efforts. But today we, we know that's, that's far from being the case now. Of course, there are still many disadvantages and who, who may not have as big a voice, but in terms of the tools and uh, access we have at our fingertips, it's much more so than say that average person, um, even 30 years ago, like even having a phone right now, we could say I, uh, anyone who has a smartphone right now has more power or access to information than say a, a world leader back in the 80s or earlier. And, and that uh, the capabilities we have with tools like this is, is uh, been a great equalizer in terms of what we can do. So today there's a room for a near infinite amount of interest and ideas to exist. All that is required is for you to build on what you know about and care for and blend it with what interests you. And don't be afraid to take risks by yourself and also, and or also with others. Uh, sorry, next slide, please. Um, because a lot of times uh, we feel that when when we hear the words pleasure and activism, we we have this idea that uh, is it's going to be plain sailing and rosy because maybe you've seen some uh, artist on Instagram whose whose life looks like a like a walk in the park, and and you feel like oh this is how it's supposed to be. How is my life not um, uh, manifesting in that way? And 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 the question is you really have to address is like, what are you actually trying to change? And what, what do you want to address? So that's not um, to say that there isn't, again, you can't have pleasure in, in your life, but it's to say that it should be part of, it's like a full balance meal in that at any given, like because of the complexity of, of the world we live in and, and the volatility of it, we're exposed to many different things over the, a course of a day, I'm sure for all of you who may be studying or, or working, you may go from happiness to confusion to, to sadness to all types of stress throughout a regular day. But um, part of the focus uh, or for me and with, with regards to pleasure activism is, is also including some element of it that um, you can strive for and, and can give you accomplishment and meaning. And that's not to say that it's, it's possible to, to garner a, a return or, or some income from it straight away but it's, it's something that you have to work towards. So, so like say me, of course, I have worked to different roles. So even say at some point I was a fashion model, I, I do uh, work to, at charities on the side of, of done like freelance writing and, and all types of mix of, of various jobs, but it's, it's working with regards to activism. It's more about, it's not for the short term, it's more about, uh, it's, it's for like what you, focusing on what you want to achieve and I and I'm jumping around so I apologize but uh, for with regards say for example every, like here are some examples of some of the work I'm doing so I released a documentary about a year and a half ago called How Toxic Are My Clothes which is about the effects of uh, toxic chemicals uh, in fashion on the human body and say for example I made that at a loss. I've, I've had to put a lot of effort into to pushing it out and getting it to places. I also made a, doc, uh, uh, a book of poetry called Weight, which is about the different ways we consume and how, um, whether that's how we consume uh, things or objects, uh, other people or, or narratives. And then as, as well, my most recent, uh, one of my more recent ventures is a, a social change initiative called Regenerative Futures and the whole idea around that is to um, essentially want to bridge the, the gap between uh, uh, the bridge the generational gap as we feel most a lot of issues that that exist in society today are exacerbated by a lack of understanding between uh, different groups in society so this could be based on age or, or or demographic or background or location and stuff like that as well. But that's not to say that I, I make a return from any of these. I, I, yeah, I think maybe I get a small percentage of book sales because I sell it at a loss as well. But I, I can't say that um, you, you should focus on, if, if you're really into the business, not business of activism, but for, for lack of a better word, the business of activism, it's, it's more, about long-term impact and what you so so at, at times you're going to have to sacrifice certain things like 
whether fin finances or or whatever but it's it's with regards to it's a long journey but you'll eventually get there and and as people kind of uh take on what you're saying or the work you're doing with with regards to your particular field it um it will grow it will grow so just uh, keep faith in what you're doing and, and just keep going but i've been rambling for a long time so thank you very much thanks thank you wilson delali you're next yeah, thank you, Wilson. That was really, really interesting. Um, well, I'm Delali. <laughs> I recently graduated from London College of Fashion and I now work as a photographer and art director. And I think there's often a certain pressure when you're trying to tell an authentic or genuine story about yourself to pretend that things just sort of happen to you and that you're on this big, great path that has always been chosen for you, um, which is really great if that's the case. but when I looked into um, the concepts of pleasure activism, what really stood out to me was how much of it was dependent on conscious decision-making and intentionally choosing optimism and joy in order for them to be acts of justice. So what I would really like to do um, in my little introduction is to frame how my conscious decisions, but also the decisions of others on a bigger scale have influenced my own work. Um, so for the, the first time from what I can remember that I really realized the subjective nature of photography on a larger scale was halfway through my teens when I lived and went to high school in um, Lilongwe in Malawi. And it was there when I really understood that much of the imagery we consume, especially in the Western world, and um, especially images created by white people on the black body and specifically on the black African body were sort of consciously created to construct a narrative that justifies um, what I would call neo-colonial existence or also um, what we know as developmental aid on the African continent. So, um, and the reason I noticed this was um, because suddenly this imagery stood in stark contrast to the content my friends and I would consume. So that was, for example, music videos on DSTV that were largely created by Nigerians or South Africans. Um, but also the images we created for ourselves really stood into contrast to um, what I'd seen in the Western world. So the first conscious decision that I made myself that has had the biggest impact on my work and on the work I create now was to nurture and maintain my relationship with my Togolese side. And this wasn't about finding estranged relatives or it also wasn't about discovering my Togolese roots, but it was really about investing into my Togolese relationships and also not just wanting to be a tourist to visit and then um, leave, but to build active friendships that extend my family as well. And when I started going to uni, this also meant building work relationships. And I started working at events such as Lonely Fashion Week, um, where I got to photograph guests. And it was actually one of my sort of first photography gigs. <laughs> and this decision opened up a, really, a string of really important conversations and reading materials for me with my Togolese friends, but also some Malawian friends. And one of the most important conversations for me was understanding the power relationship between people like me who live in the African diaspora and people who live back home. And unpacking these internal power structures within black communities. And I might have to clarify that these structures were often created through white aggression or are enforced through how we are, well we are accepted or can operate within a white supremacist system. For example, colorism is a excellent example of such um, internal power structures. So unpacking these power structures made it clear for me that I didn't want to create work that addresses white people, but the type of images that I really wanted to see and um, I believed my friends or family would really want to see too. Um, at the same time, I also started to research into France Afrique extensively for years. I just couldn't let the topic go. And it was mainly instigated through my dad who just told me about this whole thing one day and I just ever since I've been able to let it go and I continued researching um, through it through my uni years as well and 
Um, it was part of my uh, dissertation in the end. And it was also one of the first things my friends Malaika and I really bonded over or more so the belief that we need to build our own structures that can exist outside of this French colonial discourse. And that's how we um, eventually decided to create our project Togo Yuyi. And we worked with young designers or just all around creatives in um, Lomé's fashion scene. Um, Lomé is the capital of Togo. <laughs> and however, we really, uh, we only really got to test the waters with this project because I had to leave Lomi unexpectedly on an hour's notice in January 2020. And by the time I tried to return, Corona had hit the world. So there was no more traveling for us. And another big reason was that we also realized we can't really talk about celebrating and supporting artists without proper funding. Um, so far, Malaika and I have paid everything out of own pockets. Uh, Malaika is based in Lomi and she studies medicine. And I was a student at that time as well. Um, so our next objective for this project, we certainly haven't given up on it, but is to find someone who can help us sponsor um, this project to really, to just really properly pay all contributors. <laughs> and I believe the best way to sum up what drives my work is to look at certain preconceptions we have of certain matters as one single image and just like any other color photograph. Um, this image is made of lots of red and blue and green dots and the brightness of each dot determines what we see overall. So I sort of had to accept that I, I can't create a completely new image nor control every dot in its image. But what I can do is change the brightness of red, green or blue dots wherever my knowledge allows me to in order to shift our overall perception and I can tell sort of my small side of what it means to be totally And I also realized recently for myself that my experience as a black German person has validity too. Um, as mainly because I was forced to stay in Germany because of COVID for a really long time. So I started sort of digging into my um, childhood years that I've spent in Germany, how they've really alienated me from feeling German or seeing Germany as my home. And another reason for digging into this topic as well is because that the building I'm sitting in right now, um, my dad's currently building a, um, or he recently bought this building last year and he's currently building a community center and think tank for black Germans um, here in Hamburg. And these images you see here of my brothers were sort of the first experiment into the subject matter um, shot during lockdown. So. You know, I had to force them to be my models because I couldn't see anyone else. And ever since I've actually been able to work on a larger project with um, more people from our community here in Hamburg, uh, which hasn't been released yet. Otherwise I would have loved to show it. But yeah. <laughs> wow, gorgeous. Thank you so much, Dalali. Really inspiring images. Um, last stop, but certainly not least, we've got Rani. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. It is also my pleasure to be taking part in this um, discussion, very much needed discussion. And Wilson and Dalali, it was amazing seeing your work. So thank you for that. Um, I wear a number of hats, so I'm going to try and succinctly describe what I do. Um, I think by day, I, well, I don't think, I know. By day, I work as a business partner at a creative agency based in Brixton and um, South London, which is called Liberty. Um, our focus is youth marketing and working with brands and the next generation and, and the youth of today to essentially create a better future and that's working on driving social and cultural impact. And then um, alongside that day job I co-founded last year um, as a response to the death of George Floyd a platform called Brand Share the Mic, which is inspired by Lovie Anja Jones's Share the Mic Now. And that was um, taking my own insight as um, a mixed race woman on navigating an industry that wasn't created or serving um, black and brown people to get young black talent to take over big brands platforms um, in order to amplify their voices and share insights to their creativity and um, experiences. And by night, I also run a brand and a platform called Fangirl, which is a celebration 
um, of black club culture and LGBTQI club culture. And it looks to serve that community first. And um, here are some sort of edits from um, a documentary that I shot in 2019, which is called Black and Bougie, which looks at um, the, the intersect and navigating kind of being black, being gay, gender, sexuality, authenticity, and community. Um, so Fango is more than just a brand that kind of makes products, obviously understanding that both of these club scenes, black club scenes and LGBTQI plus club scenes and where they intersect have been safe spaces um, for these communities for many, many years, because outside of those spaces, they have been oppressed, um, they haven't been seen and they haven't been able to fully express themselves and the brand looks to you know, in, like drive um, self-expression, visibility and unity. Um, so I use Fangirl as a way of, I guess, um, <laughs> activating my own resistance and in some ways other people's resistance. Um, so the documentary, for example, is a way of driving visibility around untold black stories that we aren't seeing in the mainstream. It's an opportunity for me to document that through um, a black gaze. A bit like um, what Delalia said earlier is a lot of the content that we consume comes from cis, straight, white uh, gazes. And it's really important that who I collaborate with represent the communities that I'm aiming to serve. And I understand that my gaze alone is limited to. Um, so yeah, if we move to the next slide, a, another project that I did uh, September last year for London Fashion Week, which launched on Hunger Magazine as our promotional partner, uh, was our first catwalk, a CGI catwalk. Um, and this project looked to challenge the representation and the ideas of the Black diaspora within digital fashion and within CGI. Um, a lot of you are probably aware of CGI um, models and influencers such as little Michaela or Shudu who are created by predominantly white cis male studios. And um, what happens there is the, the gaze of those you know, creators kind of then end up shaping the ideas of what those CGI and models should be. The tone of voice of them is also then created by those studios. So this project wasn't about using my gaze alone to design these models. We actually um, did research with the fangirl community from the Black diaspora to inform the attributes of these um, models and also the tone of voice. So the models, we created a bespoke AI bot, uh, which then generated the tone of voices for each of the models who were interviewed by Hunger Magazine about self-expression, digital fashion. So, um, you know, I'll come on to talk about it later, but both Fangirl and Branch and the Mike have come out of um, pain, out of feeling of loss and amidst chaos. So I think it's really interesting, obviously, Delalia talked about, you know, pleasure activism is taking conscious actions to find joy. And that's definitely been my journey. Um, I definitely didn't see myself, like Wilson said, I don't see myself, like I haven't put myself out here as a pleasure activist. I have purely tried to find joy and, um, you know, found that other people have found joy in that. And it has um, challenged and in some ways impacted cultural conversations. So yeah, that's me. <laughs> wow. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for sharing who you are and what you do and some initial thoughts into what uh, pleasure means to you and what activism means to you. Um, I'm so excited to, get, to kind of get stuck into this now. I've got a very kind of broad question to, to kind of get things going off with, which is what does pleasure mean to you? So kind of a personal definition and whether or not this definition has changed in 2020 and 2021. Um, perhaps, Wilson, would you like to go first? Uh, sure. Um, I would say pleasure for me is, is like, uh, it's accomplishment. So is this, uh, I, I don't know, growing up, I, I mean, 
uh, I wasn't one of those kids who always had the idea where it's like, oh, I'm going to be this or, or go and work here or, or do this thing. I was just kind of like, I never felt pulled towards anything. So of course you reach a convergence point where that isn't, just the feeling of not feeling anything isn't enough. And of course you can come under whatever types of difficulties, whether depression or all types of things. But um, then I kind of centered myself around like, if if I'm here, then I might as well try and uh, try and add value. So for me, pleasures, or for a very long time, it's been derived from trying to accomplish things or trying to add value wherever I am. And I can't say that's changed in in the last year or so. I feel like it's it's just kind of strengthened my position on it. So it's like based on what we're seeing now, what are the what are the different ways we can I can add value, which has resulted in say regenerative futures and. We've got different projects like uh, the regenerative list where uh, essentially it's uh, highlighting 100 young innovators around the world who are doing uh, interesting work in sustainability and giving them uh, access to mentoring, uh, funding or uh, media exposure. And, and that's been uh, something that I've been deriving pleasure from in, in a sense. It's not all easy, but it, it definitely, I feel like I'm adding value in to some extent. Incredible, thank you. Um, Rani, how do you define pleasure and has it changed? Um, I think it definitely has changed during lockdown and I think it's changed through my own journey of launching the different projects. I think Wilson touched on it earlier that pleasure sits on a spectrum and I think um, the idea of what is gonna bring you pleasure isn't always the thing that brings you pleasure. And I think historically for me, I might have thought a cute bag or, you know, pampering myself, which, you know, or kind of um, doing things that might have been really at a superficial level uh, would bring me pleasure. And as a result, putting so much value on those things meant that I could no longer find value or pleasure in the smaller things. So now, you know, um, having a home and being safe and kind of fulfilling some tasks for the day, I think like accomplishing something, that brings me pleasure. Um, and I think what I found even more so, which I think I always felt, but didn't recognize it or acknowledge it was really, um, seeing, giving someone joy, bringing joy to someone brings me pleasure. Well, you both said accomplishment, but it kind of came across in a different way. I think Wilson, you were saying it was building value for more people and Ronnie, you were saying it was kind of building value for yourself. So that's mm -hmm. really interesting. How about you, Dalali? Has your definition of it changed? Um, I don't think it has, it has changed much this year. Um, I think sort of, to be honest, when I think about pleasure, it's really just, you know, honestly, just sitting with friends and just laughing until, you know, it hurts. <laughs> it's really simple um, sort of happiness in a literal sense. Um, and I think I've just, I just appreciate it so much more now when I get to see my friends and to just in person, even if it's in the park and just, you know, laugh and just be careless <laughs> um, and not sort of like I think in quarantine you have a lot of time to think for yourself and you know often very serious thoughts to just sort of be around people who you can just be careless with um, but I do have to say that I agree with Wilson as well that um, there's certainly pleasure in being able to add value to your environment and even if that's just sort of um, maybe like educating yourself or um, noticing that you're growing yourself as a person and in turn, you know, making the lives around the people, um, the people around you a bit better. So I think there's certainly um, pleasure in growth, um, even if that's just personal growth. <laughs> Lovely. I mean, that's an interesting concept there, this idea of like adding value in a quiet way, often when we talk about activism, we have this assumption that activism means protest or it's got the word action in it. So it feels like there's something that has to be done that feels frenetic in some way, possibly. But do you think then it is possible to 
action change in a softer, quieter way? Who let's take it, Ronnie? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think this is something we talked about uh, because I have never referred to myself as an activist um, because a bit like what we talked about earlier, like this idea of activism historically has been about committing your life to putting yourself, you know, out there for a bigger, greater cause. And a lot of the time that comes with a negative experiences, whether it's, um, you know, uh, protesting in quite, there's always quite been an aggressive lens around that. And um, because I wasn't out there like that, doing that, and to the definition that Wilson shared, like it's about having something tangible and I couldn't ever like box what I was tangibly doing. Um, I think I think people expect um, expect activism to come in so in coming those ways. But I think 2020, what's happening in 2020, and I think um, with the generation and in the age that we live in, in a digital age, and I think when we think about Gen Z, activism means something completely different for them. And it is about like using your Instagram page to speak out about something. Um, that That is seen as um, activism. And that's kind of, I guess, how I see like the more softer, gentler approach instead of kind of, aggressively you know taking some sort of aggressive action and I definitely think um there's power in that there's power in actually not doing it in such an aggressive way and I think there's space for all of those actions and those like motives to exist in a world like this because I think ultimately they all contribute to movement to change which is what you want you want to happen yeah, we want change. Wilson, I see you nodding along. What do you have to say about this? Yeah, um, I completely agree and, and just wanted to add on. Uh, I absolutely think that um, uh, yeah, like long gone are the days where it's like uh, like force is, is, is how things uh, change was we're, we're seeing whether it through uh, manipulative ads on social media or um, all types of other forms of conditioning. Um, we're, we're seeing the ways that uh, people's uh, thoughts and, and brain patterns can be changed, whether that's in habits and behaviors. Like uh, if you look at any documentary on, on say, con, con, uh, consumers in the 21st century, you can see how retail has got uh, fit down to a science in terms of how uh, they can make someone more susceptible to buying uh, a product probably useless to them at the point of sale or or how to adjust or design things based on on color theory or other things that make people more susceptible to saying oh i might like that or or the types of advertisements that go into um that can just make people more susceptible to to things that they may not want or need. So I absolutely think that things have shifted quietly in, say, for example, there's a great documentary called um, The Century of the Self by uh, Adam Curtis as well. And it's, it's like a four hour documentary on YouTube. It came out maybe a decade or so ago. And the whole premise is, is it just focuses on the works of Edward Bernays, who's uh, I think he's like related to Freud and, and he came to America in like the 40s or 50s and, and kind of his approach to PR and how um, this use of influence essentially kind of changed the political landscape in America. So yeah, there's there's so many different ways that um, uh, change or say, yeah, we can make a change. With, of course, I gave some negative examples, but on, on the other end, or somewhat mostly negative examples, but there's all different ways that it, uh, people can and will be influenced and it doesn't need to be uh, through self-immolation or, or, or violence. Fortunately, we're uh, much more um, open and accepting time. Dalali, how about you? I think you mentioned that you kind of were carving your own way through your kind of looking at, at your identity and and looking at yourself and finding kind of pleasure through that in some way. Um, is that, would, would you kind of class it as like a small way of actioning value or adding value? 
actioning change? I mean, I think that in a situation where you could choose despair or, you know, when, when you sort of grow up with a lot of, you know, bad things thrown at you <laughs> daily and, you know, there's obviously levels to it and for often for black people that's sort of microaggressions um, or if you're exposed to a lot of imagery of your people you know in um, it's oh sorry did I break up <laughs> okay because <laughs> I just noticed everyone froze <laughs> but yeah what I was saying is that I think sort of choosing joy when you could be choosing despair is sort of your, it is an act of justice or it is an act of activism. But I think I would agree with the other two that I I, I didn't go out there and was like, I want to be um, an activist. It was more so that I, I wanted to create something that I could consume and that my friends could consume and my family could consume. And that's just, um, I want to create the type of things that I wanted to see. And I think in a world where a lot of things that we do at I'm breaking up again. <laughs> um, I think um, in a world where a lot of things that we do are often tailored towards um, a white majority, um, that sort of in itself is um, an act of activism. But I also have to say that um, I find it quite interesting what happened last year um, with the Black Lives Matter protests and what sparked all of this, because it certainly wasn't all the beautiful imagery that had been created up to this point. And it certainly wasn't sort of all the amazing artists and people that come forward up to this point. It was actually the opposite. It was a really, really horrible um, video. So I think there is also, it seems that um, for a lot of people, these realities, or for a lot of privileged people who don't see these realities, they only become real once they get to see them face to face and have the sort of shocking effect. Um, so I think in every movement, there's, you know, everyone has sort of their different part to play in it. So for some people, that's being really loud and, you know, being on the streets and, for others, it's more sort of the work leading up to it. So I think one of the reasons why there was such a big response was also because some black cultures have become popular cultures. So so many people were much more aware um, of what was going on and obviously also through the internet, but also because a lot of these people who have big platforms now are um, black people. Um, and so, yeah, I think in this movement, I think pleasure needs to be a part of activism, but um, it's not always the, you know, it can't be the only part of one movement There needs to be sort of, everyone has their different roles to play in it. Absolutely. And like you said, there was a spark that kind of was a catalyzer to instigate change. Mm -hmm. And I think, Ronnie, that's kind of part of what happened with, with you going to Liberty and starting Brand Share the Mic that was a catalyzer in some way this negative yeah I think I think both uh Branch Heather Mike and Fangirl came from kind of um a form of pain um so I think uh with Branch Heather Mike there was obviously the death of George Floyd which kind of sparked this need to kind of take action and consider the young black talent that want to you know that are the next creatives and want to kind of make a way and shape culture and how they're not given space and for me kind of you know 15 years on in my experience and having experienced what I did in terms of being one of the few people of color in industry in, in agencies that are, I was at um I felt it was really important that uh, brands were making space for black talent in front and behind of the marketing campaigns, because to um, Delayla's point, black culture is global culture, it's pop culture. So for me, it was important that the young black talent are given space to, to help shape that culture visibly 
uh, versus being kind of borrowed and appropriated in, in different ways. So yeah, kind of that, what happened there and that being a catalyst. Um, and I was gonna talk a bit about Fangirl, but maybe I'll touch on that later and where that came from. No, you can touch on it now if you want to, but what's <laughs> interesting is that you, what you've done is actually brought a lot of joy to, to young creatives. So yes, pretty and, Yeah, and I think that's where, that's the kind of pleasure for me, right? Is I kind of, I'm in the background. No one really knows who's behind Brand Share The Mic. Um, the faces that you see are the talent and the brands, the brands pay the talent. And um, what we tend to do is kind of an impact report after each coalition. We did co three coalitions last year and we plan to do four coalitions this year. And, you know, doing a survey with the young talent and hearing that like five or four out of five um, young people that took part are saying that it gave them confidence in their creativity. It gave them confidence in working with new people. Um, it like, I think that's, that gives me so much joy, like so much joy, like getting a message from one of them saying, I never thought I would take over rankings IG and then see that they go on a few months later to shoot their first cover, which so happens to be for hunger and however many months ago, Rankin wouldn't have known about this talent. The world didn't know as much about this talent. Um, that gives me so much joy to see that because ultimately the work that I, I want to do is to create a better industry for, um, for us now and for time to come. Like we said in our precursory chat, you had no idea you're a pleasure activist. No, <laughs> no. And I think, and I think when I, so when you and I chatted and talked about pleasure activism and obviously my, like preconceptions of activism and where I think I sit on that, right? I don't think I'm out here protesting. And when I think about the work that I'm doing for Fangirl, you know, admittedly that came from a very selfish place. It came from a place of kind of darkness where it was essentially my art therapy because I was um, dealing with my own mental health issues and I was really, really struggling to express myself. So I, um, I try, I used Fangirl, you know, creating these products as a form of self-expression. And then I kind of got to this place where I was like, maybe I can share this with my friends and other people because I had experienced, um, I'd had negative experiences where I felt that my self-expression had been stifled and I'd been muted. And I thought this has given me joy, Fangirl and doing this project in my own space has given me joy. Maybe I could share it with other people. Um, but all of it was really, ultimately Fangirl was my act of resistance to all of the kind of things that have happened to me. But what I found is it's been, you know, an articulation of other people's resistance and change that they want to see in the world. And that has been like the biggest joy for me is that someone has found joy in something that brings me joy. It is like, it's, it's insane, but it's, it's been great. It is very inspiring and I feel like there's some overlap with with the rest of you with Dalali and Wilson. This idea of like sharing with other people and also sharing your own voice has been really inspiring not only for yourself but for other people as well. So I think there's a beautiful overlap there. Um, thank you Rani for sharing that. Um, Wilson, I've actually got a, a question for you and that's related kind of to what you were talking earlier about this idea of regeneration coming up as a common theme over and over again in your work. How would you how would you define pleasure and, and regeneration and how do you see that kind of from a planet first perspective possibly? Uh, I think it's my answer will kind of touch on what I started the uh, my uh, presentation with is that pleasure has to well so you can think about pleasure in like a micro and a macro so and on a on a micro level we should uh include uh like we can't just essentially be all work and no play so i feel like in terms of the the systems we create and and enable for uh ourselves and and those who come after us um need to incorporate some some type of pleasure in them and that can simply mean in that it's like it's like if you're teaching a class you or or like uh 
raising a child or, or a sibling or something, you have to uh, incorporate space for them to, to kind of play and discover and to find their own joy. So you can't be too uh, rigid in, in your approach to, to raising or, or teaching, whether they're, they're doing something good or bad. It's like they have to learn on their own and kind of find their feet in the same way. And that's not to say that, um, uh, is about kind of controlling the systems but more so in that what we build and 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 others build for us we need to allow for some kind of um pleasure in in the sense that we can derive uh, some level of joy from it like like rani said um in on a on a on a larger level i think uh pleasure is, is also uh working toward again working towards long term uh things that can help us feel accomplished and, and kind of satisfied because of course we're all here for however much time on the planet but it's like what uh most of our our long-term satisfaction comes from like the the endeavors that we push for like i i can feel an overwhelming feeling of uh uh i don't know like you can lose someone and and that can be built up over a set amount of time based on how long you knew the person for and, and the experiences you had or um on on the reverse it can be that oh you've been working slowly and slowly towards this thing over like a, a long set amount of time and you finally achieved it and it's like there's such a burst of exhilaration of course shortly after you might feel like okay i need to do the next thing but i think it's also building or considering what pleasure means at different levels in in terms of what you're in how you live and what you're working towards thank you i agree spectrum of of pleasure basically <laughs> that's what we're saying um thank you so much we're kind of coming towards the end but i wanted to ask one kind of general question again um we're hearing a lot from students that they're feeling uninspired they're feeling i don't know um a sense of, of pause as well. Um, how would you kind of spark joy in times of uncertainty? Like what would you do to help you get inspired or what, what inspires you right now? What, what could inspire students? Dilali? Um, to be honest, for the first months of lockdown, I, I mean, I was also graduating at that time, but I was feeling really uninspired too. And, I just took the pressure of me to do anything creative. You know, I think there was also like people were like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to see what creative people are gonna create in this time when they're all sitting at home with nothing to do. Um, and I was just, I just sort of tried to let go of it. Um, I was more or less successful about it, but I just tried to release myself of that pressure. And now what I do is I just go for, walks a lot and I think I sort of appreciate being able to be outside more <laughs> and um, that sort of has helped me a lot to be more creative as well or for example and then you start finding these things in really like creative sparks in really random places the other day I went to Lidl and I found this shower curtain and I bought it and I can't wait shoot something cool with it and you know so it's it's these small things when you sort of take that pressure of yourself you're usually as creative person signed back to it naturally but I also have to say I understand that when you're in uni and you have to be creative um, for your degree it's absolutely draining and um, it's often it doesn't feel like fun anymore and um, most of my when I graduated I most of it, I just did it because I had to do it and it had to be done. And then I just left it and I haven't looked at it in a long time. <laughs> but then you, you start finding back to it naturally. And I think often when the things you work on are your personal interest and that's something that's very personal to you, um, it won't feel like work, even if it's uni work, eventually. Put too much pressure on yourself. <laughs> I agree. I mean, it's all about work that's made from your passions is always the most effective work, I think. Um, Rani, how about you? How are you finding inspiration right now? Are you finding inspiration right now? Um, 
Yes and no. I think at the beginning of lockdown, I found some inspiration and was ever able to create some stuff. Um, but then hit a bit of a wall and just couldn't even work on anything to do with fangirl or really anything beyond my sort of day to day. I think um, the mind is like such a powerful thing, right? And I think we can get so congested with so much information and because we're trying to find inspiration, like we're online and we're consuming or we're looking at stuff in so many different mediums. And I think we do that naturally as creatives because we're sponges. We literally like absorb so much and like then regurgitate something beautiful as a result of that. And I guess my thing is counter to that. Like if you can, and I think this really depends on everyone's like individual mental state. And it is really, really hard depending on where you are sitting on that spectrum. But if you can just empty your mind and be really, really still and be really, really aware, I guess, of the things that come into your mind and maybe the things that you interact with, whether they're online or going for a walk and how they make you feel and think. Um, because I found kind of trying to do that um, had made me just more aware, more conscious. And I think this sounds crazy, but uh, for me, it wasn't just empty in my mind by like not going on Instagram. It was also like cleansing things around my life. So whether it was like decluttering or actually like letting go of toxic relationships, because I think they feed into what inspires us. They feed into how we think and how we feel, which ultimately comes out in our creative work. And um, they can lead to you being congested, quite literally. So um, that sort of, you know, there is no right or wrong way. And I'm not saying if you go away and do this and it doesn't work for you, I'm sorry. Um, because <laughs> I'm not an expert on it, but I think there's a like beauty in like just ridding all of the stimuli for a moment. Beautiful. Amazing, thank you. Oh, Daniel's back. I'm, I'm back. <laughs> I'm back. I, for, for a bit of timekeeping, I'm conscious that we're, we're at our hour um, and there've been a few questions that have come in from our attendees um, that I wouldn't mind just, just kind of, if, if everyone's okay to stay another five, 10 minutes yeah. to see if we can get through some of these um but Rani I think that's a really beautiful thing that you've just said and and for me and my own journey and my own understanding of of pleasure activism and being a pleasure activist you know in essence it's it's really that it's about being able to say no and being able to say yes and as Dalali so beautifully put it at the beginning as well it's about the consciousness that we bring to that space and that ability to say no to something and to say yes to something so in kind of navigating through this time where what do we need to say continued no's to in order to create yeses for for other other things as we move forward um just there's been a lot of questions that have come in uh, lots of lovely comments as well so don't hesitate to continue uh, sending in your comments and adoration for the great work um and and thoughts that you've all shared um, but there was, there's been a lot of questions that have come in around the term activism. I think that's a really interesting thing that I'm kind of seeing through these questions and also, you know, hearing through the discussions that we're having um, and the thoughts that you've shared. Um, and this, this is a, a question um, that I thought was quite interesting from Ivan. Do we need an ultimate collective goal to do activism or can it be an individual journey? And he's also uh, questioned, is there a risk that activism is becoming an aesthetic buzzword due to this online culture? Um, but I guess, you know, if anyone would have any thoughts around the individual and collective, you know, I think it really did come up in, in your conversations, the idea of the scales of pleasure and the scales of activism. So if anyone, I see yeah. Wilson's voice. <laughs> yeah, sure, um, I'd love to. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, for me, so with regards to sometimes occupying different spaces, whether it's like sometimes I'm an artist, sometimes a writer or, or whatever the title may be for when 
say after doing an interview or have a feature, uh, there's all types of titles which might be attached to my name. And, and, and sometimes it's just, it's more about what's the best way for the person who's interviewing you to communicate that to their audience. So in the same way, uh, you can't, while activism is a, a title and word in itself, you can't um, use that as the, like you have to separate yourself from titles and, and terms, like you can't be defined by, by what your, uh, what the word you have to use to describe yourself in a room full of people is, is, is simply just uh, a placeholder for just because of the, the limits of language. So I'd say that, and then uh, definitely, uh, sorry to use the word with regards to activism, it, it absolutely can be thought of an, at different levels. So it's, it's yeah, I, I feel like there's no limit to how insular it is or how external it is and, and to who that encapsulates. And that's all about, it's all about your personal journey and what you feel comfortable with doing because something that you might feel comfortable doing I might be too far out of my level of comfort to do or, or something I'm not prepared to do yet or, or, or feel capable of fighting. So I think whatever you feel comfortable with and, and whatever uh, battle you want to take on, go for it. I think that's, yeah, a really, really important point. And this idea that's kind of coming through someone in the in the Q and A also talked about that idea of pleasure as an expression of agency, um, and a question which I think is a is a is a really nice maybe close. And I have some of the names of people who've put in questions, so I might send them also to the panelists. And if they're so kind and they have the time, they might be able to respond with some thoughts. Um, but a question, I guess, it kind of. Yeah, do the participants, the panelists have any daily practices or rituals that support their creative practice of living? So thinking about the way you live as being a creative act in its, in its own right, I'd be interested to hear um, if anyone has any thoughts on that, any would like to share an insight. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a lot to make uh, that, daily commitment in the world that we live in but um I think lockdown has made me want to and has made me sorry a lot more conscious about how I live and the actions that I take so um obviously self-care is a massive part of that like caring for myself as an act of resistance to the social system that I'm forced to kind of navigate is a really really important thing and realizing why it's important that I do that um, I think then second, secondary is kind of consciously thinking about how I interact with others that are also marginalised by that system that is also um, oppressing them. And I try to do that. Obviously, Fango is a non-gendered brand. Um, I have a lot of background in kind of marketing to women X and trying to de-gender marketing so a lot of that comes down to me checking myself with the language that I use because I understand that communication has advertising marketing has led to perpetuating ideas of gender as well as race so I mean that's the way the the conscious things that I'm trying to do um, and there's always more that I could be doing I'm sure Any of the other panelists wish to share any daily rituals or practices at this time that helps them? Yeah, sure. Um, so there was one thing that uh, I didn't get the chance to answer the inspiration question, and I think it ties in. For me, over the last year, I um, somewhat in contrast to Rani, but also employing some of her approach. For me, I think it was more about learning to live in, in the eye of the storm or kind of just kind of being able to adapt to chaos because at, at this point we live in such a highly volatile uh, world where you're exposed to all types of things on a daily basis that um, it can be very difficult to, to uh, protect yourself from and to kind of um, stay somewhat stable within so I feel like I've learned to ride ride the wave essentially and sometimes riding that wave kind of brings 
uh, helps bring inspiration. So to answer this question, I would say that I, I invite a lot of chance into my into my day to day and, and it's not consistent. So like say, I don't know, a friend got me a, 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 a deck of tarot cards like a week ago. And every time, like I might ask myself a question and then just randomly pull a card out of the deck or not even ask and then just kind of read the meaning where it means up, right, down, right. And then just kind of use that as something to reflect on. Or it could be that, oh, um, I, I go outside and do some type of activity. It could be go for a walk or, um, okay, I'm gonna go and order food from this place today. Or I'm going to, or it's like even say, sometimes you might get a work request and you don't know here, you, you might not feel, uh, I'm not sure how I feel about it. It, it could be flipping a, a, a coin to, to determine whether you wanna do it or not. So I think sometimes it's inviting that chance and, and of course, there's various other examples, but I think it's not being too solid about how how things go. And I think that's like a, a something I incorporate into my daily life to keep me uh, fluid, let's say. I like that fluid, riding the wave. <laughs> and Dalali? Um, I don't think I have a daily thing that I do every day, but what I do try to do is sort of um, read a lot and just you know order lots of books <laughs> um, just to keep me educated and sort of keep my mind open I think that has just become really important for me recently and also not putting too much pressure on myself in terms of planning too far ahead so similar to what Wilson said riding a wave just um, taking whatever comes at you um not getting too angry over um sort of the news when there's a new lockdown restriction or anything like that just um yeah it's, i think maybe the daily thing i do is just you know keeping a positive mindset and just reminding myself that you know some things are sort of out of my control and um yeah just take it day by day take every day as it comes um but also what i've been doing is um just sort of always pinning down my values I think and just sort of I think when there's so many things coming at you at this time from so many different sides um just yeah pinning down your values and sort of still remembering on a larger scale even if there's COVID where where you want to go so you don't get lost in you know in this in this inability to plan so, you know, it's still feel some sort of, that I still have some sort of control over my life. Beautiful, I love that. I mean, it's similar in a way, understanding your values, checking them with tarot cards, all of these <laughs> interconnected and, and synergies that we're, we're seeing. I'm, I'm conscious that we're at time, I would love nothing more than to continue these conversations around pleasure and pleasure activism and activism and what's really become clear which you know is, is really the gift that you've given us in starting this dialogue is the space to redefine some of these terms you know and 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 as we move forward into this new unknown future uh, to really understand the potential for activism to redefine it to think does that language sit with my practice with my work you know where are those spaces and the scales for pleasure uh, small soft action stronger action when needed um, and the importance, I think, of, you know, the individual um, agency that we all have around, you know, the simple act of self-care, as you beautifully put it, Rani, you know, and the impact of self-care that has on that, as I spoke about in the beginning, that the kind of living ecology that we all have, you take care of the self, you take care of of the greater, the greater good and the greater ecological systems that we all find ourselves within. So unfortunately, I'm really sorry that we won't be able to answer all the wonderful uh, questions that did come in. But as I said, I'll make an attempt to, to get those answered if possible. Um, but we will be having more conversations on pleasure and pleasure activism over the coming months. And we're really excited to bring this dialogue now in back into the, 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 the students um, and into the units to be able to listen to our students as well to understand you know what space pleasure and pleasure activism might hold if it holds space in 
uh, as a, or as a tool for us to kind of move forward into the future. So I want to thank you all, Shanu, for moderating this beautiful panel and all of you for your vulnerability and your gorgeous work and for just being human with us in this little space that we've had today. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Peace and love. Thank you all to the attendees. Yes, thank you everyone.